Hi, and welcome to the Titans Together podcast. This is volume three. I am Joe Pride, and with me as always... James, glad to be here. We have so much to go through. Um, I honestly was just like, I wasn't exhausted reading volume three, but like the lore dump in this volume, I would borderline say it's like insurmountable. There's just so much going on. We open with uh, issue 17. We had another like weird lackluster ending um, from volume two with like these strange epilogue stories that like, while very character focused, they just don't seem to be attached to the main story as it's collected in these volumes. Uh, And this one is definitely collected in a weird way because I was expecting to get into like issue 24, 25 by the Mm -hmm. end of this. And we get a weird detour into one-shot stories so for this collection. <laughs> yeah, we take a, a long break. I mean, I found this probably the weakest narrative structure so far. Um, there isn't very much a strong through-line story here. It's sort of villains of the week and then a sort of introducing the Teen Titans, which I guess it has been about two years of publishing at this point. And I remember Young Avengers doing a very similar thing where it was a year or so in and they did Young Avengers Presents and it was these sort of retelling the origin stories, I presume to try and introduce more of the market to the characters and get people more invested. So I feel like that's a very similar thing with the tales of the new Teen Titans. It's sort of a retelling of origin stories. You get some more details and some more background that fill them out a little bit more, but it doesn't exactly fit the story. It's kind of like, hey, we're going to talk about our backstories again, just to make sure you know. And go camping. Yeah. I mean, who doesn't want to see them go camping, I guess, but to make it go for four issues was just like, whoo, okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> And I, for one, don't like narration as a storytelling device, Uh, specifically in like television. I think it's grading, but Mm. like here, it's just nothing but narration towards the end. And I'm just like, I just want to see the story flow. I don't, I don't need to hear somebody narrating it. I know Mm -hmm. like Cyborg is like telling a story of his life at a campfire, but I don't need to be constantly reminded that he's right there. Like in Beast Boys too, Beast Boys was the most egregious one, but we'll get into that later. So before we get into the strange like campfire storyline, uh, we're gonna go back to issue 17, where the first three issues are kind of like very Wally centric. Mm-hmm. And I know that we both have reservations about Wally as a character at this point, which is so crazy to me because yesterday I was literally just saying to somebody how much I don't like Barry Allen as a character and that I prefer Wally. But like mm-hmm. Wally here as a teenager is like, oof. Can we just skip to like Wally as the Flash or Wally as like an older person who like knows how to be funny? Because sometimes mm. here he's just like. I feel like he's sort of you. blank. Like yeah. Robin gets the sort of mastery in charge aspects and Cyborg gets to be angry, whatever that is. And Beast Boy gets sort of the humor aspect. And then that leaves Wally just give me kind of being like, I'm a dude. I'm here. Things are okay. I'm, I'm conservative <laughs> for some reason, <laughs> which we'll get into. Issue 17, told in chapters, which was strange for a comic book, um, focuses on Frances Kane and her relationship with Wally West. And we had gotten a brief mention of her, I think, before. She uh, comes to him with problems about these weird powers she's developing. And we kind of get this, like, pseudo... Carrie storyline uh mm-hmm. Stephen King's Carrie but like in the Teen Titans mythos it feels sort of disconnected and I feel like all of these stories have a subtle sort of 80s level misogyny to them and that <laughs> the women aren't really very fleshed out they're kind of there to be sort of problems sort of damsels in distress in a way it's not quite women in refrigerators but it's also not like, this isn't really the Francis Kane story. It's the Teen Titans try to help Francis Kane story. And she's just sort of there. Yeah. No, I definitely see what you're saying. Um, especially when it comes to, like, the mother. If I could get, like, any other dimension other than she thinks her daughter's, like, the <laughs> devil, that would be nice. 
something I actually appreciate from the the film carry that like they actually flesh out the mom into something different. But you know, mm. I digress. We also established that she knows she knows Wally's origin story that his secret identity isn't so secret. Kind of also like I think you had mentioned it before. George Perez and Marv Wolfman trying to like chip away at like superhero tropes. And Francis is kind of like, I think that where she's like, I've known you my whole life. Mm. I'm, I knew you were flash like the minute you got powers, which was really interesting to me that I kind of appreciated that. Like, you know, you can have people that know each other's secret identity and like, they can continue on being friends. It doesn't like have to like be the death sentence that it used to be mm. or that it is, which seems like a tired trope. Now. I mean, like we just watched invincible, with these same themes being brought up, but like, it's interesting to see it so far back being reflected upon. Her power of choice is basically like Magneto where she like has these crazy magnetic waves, um, but she can't control them. And it's going crazy in the background is her mom always thinking she's possessed by the devil. Part of what compels me to say, I feel like these are some weaker issues, some very sort of challenge of the week because the resolution is basically Cyborg is just like, wait a minute, I have a magnetic canceller in my system. I'll just do it. And it's like, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> there's, It's really weird also because the story doesn't actually invest in what's going on. Marv does his little double epilogues. Like that's another thing I find super weird. He's not just using epilogues. Each of these issues has two two epilogues. And so he uses not one, but two epilogues to finally explain after the fact that um, Green Lantern had trapped Dr. Polaris in some sort of between the dimensions realm. And he's been attempting to come back through Francis, which didn't make a ton of sense to me. I don't know that Dr. Polaris and Francis have met. Um, I, so the way I read it was like, he recognized her powers in the magnetic dimension and kind of wanted to use her as a conduit to escape from said dimension. Hmm. I, I thought the twist ending was, ending was kind of interesting, uh, mostly because I was like, oh, there's an epilogue part two. What the heck could this be? I just thought this was a, like you said, like a story of the week, like teenager with powers growing up doesn't know how to control them. And while like, I, I totally agree. It's like very basic. I do love Frances Kane, mostly because of what she becomes later on. And I don't want to spoil that, but she's pretty great in certain aspects. A very tragic character, I think. And then from like this beginning, knowing I never knew her origin story completely. I knew that she knew Wally. Mm. Um, but to know like what she went through when her powers first emerge, it's not surprising where she ends up. And that's all I'll say about that. <laughs> um, An element of foreshadowing to all these stories, I would say. I call them very kind of out of nowhere and disconnected, but each of them does have a sort of hanging element where you can see something ready. Oh, to yeah. Go. Yeah, because I mean, at the end of the story, she kind of leaves Wally. She admits she loves him and is like very... Uh, Lana Lang in a sense like I got very strong Lana Lang vibes from her where she's like you know I love you Wally I'm always gonna have love for you thank you for helping me solve these problems I'm gonna go try and live my life whatever that is now Mm. and it just kind of ends off there before we get the two epilogues so it's very interesting to see like that plot thread just like waiting Mm because I know it's gonna show up later on which is pretty cool it also makes uh, the second time someone's proclaimed their love for Wally, but nothing really coming of it immediately, which why is a weird is thing they're doing. Why people are loving? I don't understand. <laughs> I don't see it. Yeah. I think I like, I like Francis with Wally more than I like him with Raven, but I still don't understand why Wally is like the one who constantly gets hauled in love with because I don't understand the appeal. However, I, mean, I digress. Gingers are a thing, I guess, but... <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> so that brings us into issue 18, which is probably my favorite issue of this whole uh, volume. I had messaged you while I was reading it being like, I hope I didn't like gas it up too much. But like issue 18 was like really good, in my opinion. So we get the old Starfire reintroducing himself into this new era of the Teen Titans, in this volume, I think the one benefit I really like is that it mentions the Golden Age stuff so much, particularly in this issue and then in one issue in um, Tales of the Teen Titans later on. Uh, Starfire was a mainstay in the Teen Titans comic books of the Golden Age. And he, now he goes by Red Star. So I guess we could have we could call him that if you want. 
Oh, I would like to take exception with the like, you misnamed yourself, dude. Like there's there's no stars, there's no fire. What's what's up? <laughs> I really don't know why they named him that. I think it's it's it was baffling like learning about him when I was younger, and it's so baffling now. Like, what gave him that moniker? Like, why that? I'm so glad it went to Corey because it it it's so much more suited, right? Like mm. so much more suited. But we get this really long introduction in issue 18 about uh, Merrick Slavic and his plan for revenge and his whole scheme of sending uh, an operative to America uh, whilst in Russia to like basically destroy America from the inside. It feels super dated with the sort of Red Scare evil Russians, but I think in one way that it's actually very progressive for the time is the way that it's not like a scheming USSR government they're going to take over. It's this one bad apple sort of scenario. And so then we get Red Star as the example of good Russia trying to stop these people who have kind of stepped out of line. And so that was interesting to me that it wasn't just, oh yeah, evil Russians, ha ha ha. There's actually some degree of nuance to it, which I appreciate. Yeah, and there's so much context in terms of like Red Star's appearance in America and what that means to the Teen Titans and what that means to certain characters in the Teen Titans, like Wally, again, I roll. Uh, <laughs> what that means for his character in terms of what he thinks of what Russia is. Honestly, I feel like Marv and George were using Wally as a reflection of like the audience to kind of teach them something where like Wally's mentality of like Russia's always bad, Russia's the always the bad guy red scare like you said like all that nonsense basically is like wally's the audience and this whole issue was basically teaching wally like don't believe these preconsumptions like Mm. it isn't always it isn't right like especially when we find out later what red star's actual motives were which was great oh what an ending it was so sad but his full name is leonid kovar who we see a lot more as time goes on in the Titans lore. So get used to him. (laughs) I don't know what you thought about him personally, but I really like Red Star. Uh, What were your, this is your first introduction to the character, no? Yeah, my first time seeing him. Um, I mean, I found it, of course, weird with the name and that sort of aspect. And it also makes it kind of funny because the issue has this cover line of the return of Starfire, but it's not just Corey Starfire, it's the return of both Starfires. And they never resolve that name issue on the page, which I found kind of weird. But I mean, he's interesting i don't feel like the powers are very well defined and again with the name that was sort of confusing but in the idea of him being a positive representation for the ussr and um having that sort of reverse element to the story where wally thinks he's the bad guy but there's more to it is interesting we get like the as you brought up Wally, we get the 80s version of like what it means to be a conservative. Now, as two very <laughs> I venture to say very liberal people, uh, it was very jarring to see like what the political idea of conservative was back in the day and what that meant for Wally as a character. So it was very strange to see his reasonings and like to get into his head because it does a lot of inner monologuing about why these characters are thinking the way they're thinking. Hearing Wally's thoughts was just like dude what i'm sorry (laughs) what (laughs) why so um, amidst all this chaos of red star coming to america and trying to find why uh people are dying of radiation poisoning we're seeing uh i didn't know how to pronounce her name and i'm probably gonna botch it if somebody's rushing and watching this i apologize i i don't know uh her name is melody that's how i pronounced it I think that so. Right? It's sort of a I pun think... because malady means like a plague, an illness. And so they were kind of playing on that, I think, thinking they were more clever than I found the play on words. But... <laughs> <laughs> so she, she arrives in America under the idea that she's just going to be doing her job. Meanwhile, anyone she comes into contact with uh, is getting this really bad plague. She, they're like dying of like radiation poisoning. And it was kind of triggering hearing about a potential pandemic Mm. in the U.S. in the 80s. And I'm just like, 
as we're dealing continuously with one now. But she's infecting people with this plague unbeknownst to herself. And the Teen Titans, Wally specifically, just want to end her life. Mm -hmm. Very starchly, they're like, no, she needs to go. She's potentially going to kill all of the U.S., which I guess is true in a way. But then Red Star enters the scene and he's like, no, if anyone's going to do anything to her, it's going to be me. And meanwhile, the rest of the Titans just want to know what's going on. They just want to know, like, they want to ask her why she's doing this or, like, figure out, like, there's more to the story. But Mm -hmm. Wally doesn't see that. Wally just wants to, like, cut this and go. So through mishaps and through fighting, because there is infighting both within the team itself and with Red Star, some really great panel work again by George, might I add. We find out that Melody didn't know anything. She was just there Mm -hmm. to do her job. How did you feel about the twist ending? And I don't know I want to say it, but you can say it. (laughs) Um, I mean, I felt like that seemed sort of cheap to me. Um, The idea that Red Star and Melody are lovers, like it's planted very early on when she's about to ship over to Russia or to the US from Russia. And she's like, will I be back in time for my wedding? So that was a thread that was hanging open. But then in the end, when he's like, oh, yes, and I wanted to kill her because I was sparing her before because I loved her. It was just sort of like, oh, I mean, very helpful to have been able to say that in the moment. And I mean, the whole story (laughs) runs on the idea of there's no time. So we'll fight because there's no time. But I don't know. You know I hate the heroes fighting. (laughs) You do. You do not like heroes fighting. And of all things, this is another one of those moments where like, if y'all had a conversation, this would have been solved like 10 minutes ago. But I really loved the twist ending, especially for what it does to Wally as a character. Mm -hmm. And like, I didn't see the twist coming too. And I love when that happens to me when I'm reading something. And I mean, I consume media so often that like, sometimes I see this stuff coming. But like, when he's like, no, like she was my, she was to be my wife. Like, I have jurisdiction over what's ha- what happens to her mm-hmm. that happening at the end of the issue. And like, really was like, so one tragic, so sad that like your poor betrothed, like didn't even know she was causing all this pain and suffering. And like, you're the only person who can stop her heartbreaking. And then um, just what it means for the team as a whole, like the lesson I think they came out of that was really impactful to me. Like, definitely a bright issue in my opinion i think it's my favorite one of this one we don't get any more red star this volume but he will return thankfully and with a new name i know that they like mention like oh maybe he needs a new name and then they drop it like immediately <laughs> they, he gets a new name trust <laughs> he comes back gets a new name but now we're into issue 19 uh, and this one features another cameo we get more more jla so this one is all about hawkman and dr light Uh, Escaping from prison in order to enact some pseudo revenge against the Riddler. Light has at this point been established as a Titans villain, so it's not, I accuse it of making not a lot of sense, but it at least has that going for it. But then to the degree that I don't feel like Hawkman fits in especially well and doesn't really have a position in the story other than to be like, well, he was after these artifacts and I'm an archeologist, so I will provide a one panel expo dump on what this artifact is. And that was kind of his purpose, really. Even even the fight scene between him and Dr. Light was like, that was it? He <laughs> set his wing on fire. Okay, <laughs> and we're moving on. I thought what was most perplexing is Dr. Light's reason for escaping prison is just because the Riddler is stealing money from Batman. Like that was his whole motivation. This issue was just that the Riddler is like pulling one over on Batman. So Dr. Light has to like one over the Teen Titans. Like, don't you just want to escape prison to escape prison? If you could have just escaped prison, why didn't you just escape prison? Like, yeah, it was baffling to me when like, that was his entire motivation for doing what he was doing. Mm -hmm. I was dumbfounded. Like also to never establish that, like, Dr. Light has anything against any other villains and then all of a sudden he's just like super peeved that Riddler's being a good villain what? (laughs) I was so confused it's that Um, weird idea where the Fearsome Five get formed over villains weekly the like 80s DC I'm not sure the right word their idea of the universe is that villains kind of sit around palling with each other and be like oh I need to out-villain you. Now I saw it in the paper. 
It's it's odd. Weird. <laughs> it's not it's how we odd. think about villains these days. <laughs> I'm never gonna get used to it. I with the minute we get out of the 80s and into the 90s, I'm going to like breathe a sigh of relief that maybe there will be a little bit more connected tissue into why the why certain villains do what they do mm. because this is weird. <laughs> Um, and then he ends up running to the Titans for help, which I found odd because I think of Dr. Light as a more villainous person than he is at this point. Like, I don't think he's a rapist yet, for example. And so it's very weird for me to know what he becomes and see the Titans being like, oh, yeah, we'll help you out. I'm like, no, don't. It's so weird. Into jail. <laughs> it's so strange. Like, we haven't even gotten to, like, identity crisis. I mean... If you read Identity Crisis, where they confirm what he did, uh, that was in this age of comics. Like, mm. I think I remember specifically Zatanna was wearing the, like, jewel thing. Like, this this is when it happens at some point. So, very strange to see. Yeah, like you said, like, it's just weird when, like, the statues of Vishnu come to life because he's a dummy. And he comes to the Titans asking for help. He breaks in another Titan trope. He breaks into the Titans Tower very easily. So there's our uh, break in at Titans Tower trope to ask the Titans for help. Meanwhile, the statues of Vishnu are running amok and Hawkman just spends half the issue like repairing his wing until like the very end. They kind of realize like they have to go back to the museum and like put whatever... It was like, how did they, how did they escape? It was like some gem that he like reflected light on. Yeah, the light and then it released crystals them. and that somehow unleashes the magic statues. Strange. I, I, <laughs> I can see this being a mission in like DC Universe Online and that being fun, but like as a story, what? <laughs> so they realize they have to go back and like reflect light onto the gem crystal thing again. Mm -hmm. uh, which kind of is used as a giant metaphor for Starfire to get over Franklin, this issue. Um, amidst, like, issues 18, 17, 16, she's kind of spent a lot of time being forlorn, uh, just generally depressed about, like, Franklin's loss, which I can't wait for her to get over, and she finally does. Uh, this issue, by kind of unleashing her full power and, like, using that to somehow trap all of the statues in the crystal again by the end of the issue... And that's kind of used as like her reckoning of like getting over Franklin's death, um, which I know you could appreciate, right? <laughs> like yeah. that we're finally over. I mean, Franklin- She takes longer to get over him than she did to get under him. <laughs> it's... Yeah, basically. <laughs> Amidst all of this, both at the beginning and the end of this issue, uh, we get like a Sarah Sims update because we haven't really seen her since she was captured by Deathstroke. Uh, mm -hmm. Cyborg's been like, keeping tabs on her but he hasn't really confronted her yet since everything happened and they give a timestamp. it's been about like two months since all of that went down i just want sarah sims back yeah <laughs> i want her back i love her she's so great cyborg really needs to like get over it and like just talk to her because i like her mm -hmm. <laughs> uh and at the end of this issue she actually goes to terry long for help and then we don't hear anything about it mm -hmm. the rest of the volume and we I don't was know so what annoyed. She <laughs> we don't know what the plan is, but we know Sarah is there, which I guess is better than nothing. But... Better than nothing, I guess. True. She is mentioned in Cyborg's story in mm -hmm. the Tales of the Teen Titans, so that's nice. But if we don't get more Sarah Sims in the next volume, I'm going to be upset. I need to know what her and Terry talked about. Like, I need Sarah to, like, just walk into Titan's Tower because apparently everybody can and be yeah. like, Cyborg, you're a dummy. Like just let's be friends again it's okay like please mm -hmm. but that brings us into issue 20 and it's all about wally again <laughs> i'm telling you these these four issues it's just so wally centric and i'm just like okay well here we go <laughs> this one though to its benefit has such good panel work oh my god like everything i never thought i could like find writing a letter like drawing the idea of writing a letter so captivating and so interesting. And George Perez does such a phenomenal job at making this issue not boring in that sense. Mm. And I hate narration, right? Like the, the narrative device of like him writing a letter and then showing what's happening in the letter is like annoying to me on paper. Right. But then when you read it and like, you see the beautiful artwork, like 
makes it so much more forgiving because it's just so stunning. I think it is interesting in the way it was constructed to very much juxtapose um, Wally versus this disruptor character who even in that sort of reverse flash element, I would point out that his costume kind of reverses the colors of Wally that really blatantly makes it. It's these two versus each other. Um, and in the theme of Wally's conservatism, I think one thing that is sort of an interesting contrast is that the problem with Disruptor is that his dad is a horrible person who hates it, right? And the ultimate thrust of the issue is Wally is who he is because he's had loving and supportive parents. And I think that kind of supports this 80s conservatism because it's more the old school conservatism. He's not like reactionary. We need to go back to the way things were nonsense like conservatives today. He's more just like, you know, I'm an all American dude who everything has been fine and my parents love me and I just want things to be the way that they are. I don't know what's going on. That's the yeah. way I view his conservatism. Um, and so it's good because you get to see kind of more where the Titans come from and have that contrast of where their enemies come from as well. Yeah. I think Disruptor was very lucky of a villain to get so much backstory. And I think it benefits that his dad is brains bedlam, uh, a Batman villain. I didn't even know of. <laughs> I had to like Google him and be like, who is this guy? Like this isn't like Bruno Mannheim or Falcone or, you know, any other gangster within the DC universe, this is brains bedlam. And I'm, I was, who? <laughs> when he's like, I'm, I'm a villain of the Batman and you're disappointing me. And I'm like, you're disappointing me. I didn't even know who you were. Like, who are you, dude? <laughs> well, I don't know why you're putting so much pressure on your son. You ain't making headlines. Like, what? We get the disruptor, like you said. And there is... The name Disruptor has a legacy within the Teen Titans, so it's very interesting to see it start here. I'd imagine a lot of the characters that I like when I read comic books, starting in like the Jeff Johns run, a lot of them have these beginnings here. So it's interesting. I didn't even know there was a Disruptor before the one. Well, I knew there was a Disruptor before the one I read, but I didn't really look into his story. So it's interesting to see this character here. You know, this is the debut of the name Disruptor. As sad and tragic as it is, like, this guy can't catch a break. <laughs> how did you feel about his powers and how they seemingly do whatever they want? <laughs> yeah, I, I felt that was a little weak. Um, supposedly the suit has technology that gives him the ability to disrupt anything, which is sort of weird because like I could buy I'll disrupt your powers, but then he's like, I'll disrupt your flow of blood. I'll disrupt this sewer system. I'm like, so it's just reality altering, really? It doesn't make a ton of sense. No sense. Um, no sense, but you know what? I'll, I'll take it over some of the other characters that we've <laughs> we've dealt with in terms of powers we get some interesting seeds being sown in this issue uh particularly for me donna talking to terry about her lack of an origin story it's cyborg's birthday as of this issue and donna is very weary of the idea of birthdays and reminds terry that like she doesn't know her she doesn't know her origin story she doesn't know where she came from so the idea of birthdays is very gross to her very triggering and it's like, I want to get to that issue already. <laughs> I want to get to that issue so bad. But it's fun to see like, you know, the continued idea that like, this is going to be talked about later. It's just the characters know about it already, which is really interesting. Also, happy birthday, Cyborg. Um, I don't remember when this was, when the issue was posted, 82. but like, so, you know, he's kind of an old man now, but it's fine <laughs> <laughs> if we go canonically. <laughs> the Hive origin story, or I guess... The some of the mysteries behind what the hive are are kind of dismantled in this issue where it's found out that hive is comprised of scientists who have previously lost to villains. And that's why they're so smart. I don't get it. I don't <laughs> like it. <laughs> I, I, I would have gone so much more without knowing that idea of that mystery. They could have just stayed this mysterious people trying to stop Teen Titans at any given moment, but to know that's what it is. Also, what scientists? Like, <laughs> who? <laughs> Very confusing. It just raises up so many weird questions. 
for me, I'm just going to keep the the hive as like the weird m- people in purple robes because yeah. this idea is very strange. It makes them kind of confusing because previously they were, I would say, more established as like an assassin ring, I would say. So the motivation doesn't really click to me. And then again, I have complained before about Hive having that weird, are they a cult? Are they scientists? Like it both, I guess. Uh, <laughs> it's so strange. I and, and then for it to like be announced in one panel, I'm like, what is happening? Mm. I mean, and it makes sense, I guess too, because it's the entire motivation behind the story uh, Brain's Bedlam was using his son as a way to, of getting into Hive uh, if Disruptor was successful, which, hello, he's not. <laughs> the poor kid just was not going to catch a break this issue. I mean, from the beginning, like, we knew it wasn't going to work out in his favor. <laughs> there are a couple battles in this issue. Uh, Disruptor kind of takes out most of the Titans, uh, thinks they're all dead. Brain's Bedlam is kind of there, almost as like the audience, in a way, being like, you didn't see their dead bodies, so they're definitely not dead. And I've done this before. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, is he like me? <laughs> like, is he supposed to be the audience being like, they're not dead, dude. Like, come on. You didn't mm-hmm. see them dead. Wally is like somehow the sole survivor of all of this and kind of learns humility by defeating him in like the weirdest way. He manages to save all the Titans before they're killed by the Disruptor, he brings them to him. And Raven kind of shows Disruptor his worst fears as a failure. And that's what ultimately wins the battle. So it was very interesting to see like Wally being the linchpin of the team, like the one to really carry this issue against my better wishes. (laughs) I thought it was kind of weird that Raven kind of explicitly tortures Disruptor and explains that it was necessary because otherwise he would become an even worse person. And I was like, okay, um, <laughs> like, that was a bit much, I felt. And then, like I said, I feel the main resolution is this juxtaposing Brains Bedlam versus Wally's parents because Brains is visiting Disruptor in the jail being like, you're an idiot, you're a failure, you're dead to me. I even go to the prison then, but <laughs> he does that. And then we get to finish out Wally's letter and he's like, mom and dad, thank you for being there for me. <laughs> It's quite the contrast. Very strange. You're talking about the after story, the one, it was it in oh, your issue. Oh, the, your okay, yeah, the yeah. five page. It felt a lot longer than five oh pages Oh my God, it felt me. so long. Like, I, for a while, I thought it was its own issue. And I'm like, wow, they actually published this. But it's just a joke story, I guess, where the Titans and Marv and George, because this is sort of an out of universe continuity face, Dr. Igor, 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 Igorievich. Um, And it's, I don't know, maybe it was funnier in the eighties. It's all just a silly, this mad scientist pulls everyone out of their universe into his, he's quickly defeated. Marv gets to hit on Starfire. <laughs> um, I knew you were. I knew you were gonna enjoy that. I knew it. I knew reading this, he was like, "Oh, oh no, oh no." He doesn't look that much like Terry Long. They're drawn very differently. Yeah. I do want to. I want to make that known. <laughs> it's very clear that Terry is cuter. <laughs> it was weird. I I didn't know what I was reading. I was very like, "What?" I thought it was done, and then we get well. Th- to its benefit, right? As much of a joke thing as this part is, we do get the first mention of Earth Prime, to my knowledge, which is basically us. Like, we're Earth Prime. It's the Earth where superheroes are basically what we know them to be. They're fictional characters written on paper. And that Earth Prime has been used so much more, especially when I was reading books. I don't know if this is, like, the first incarnation of Earth Prime or, like, if this is even the first mentioning of it, it kind of sounds like it was the way they were writing it. Crazy to me that this is where it began, that in (laughs) this like weird epilogue story, the super, the earth prime started with George and Marv being introduced to the characters they write. And it's not weird. And and then reality doesn't like end in and of itself. Like it was so bizarre, so bizarre that I'm not even going to like include 
Igor, Igor, et cetera, et cetera, into Shikir Week. No, this, <laughs> I mean, this is like the, and I don't know if you watch all of Steven Universe, but there's an episode of, um, of the show called Uncle Grandpa, where it's like a crossover between the two. Mm-hmm. Uncle Grandpa was another cartoon on Cartoon Network. No one, no one uh, acknowledges its, its existence. We just present, we just pretend it doesn't exist. So I'm just going to pretend that this doesn't exist, other than the fact that it acknowledges Earth Prime. That's all I'm going to do. Okay. I don't need to. <laughs> I don't need to go back to this ever again. Um, the thing I would point out is that right before the segue, I guess we'll call it, we're promised the next issue is the greatest foe yet, Brother Blood, and then that doesn't happen in this volume. We get the weird story and then we get the tales of the teen titans immediately after like so not the next issue but several issues issue. later i feel like that might be that might be a failing of the way that they're collected not necessarily the storytelling itself mm. because i before you told me what was included in volume three and i had to look it up on wikipedia i was just going to read the next eight issues i was like okay well on the next eight And Mm then I asked you what was included and I saw on Wikipedia, like, this is the list. And I'm like, what? (laughs) (laughs) Like, what? I don't understand it. But, you know, I'm here. Here we are. This is Tales of the New Titans. And these are one shots of Cyborg, Raven, Beast Boy, and Starfire. And all told with the backdrop of them going camping in the Grand Canyon because they need a break. (sighs) Weird. (laughs) So weird and so strange, but we do get a lot of cool moments. There is stuff to appreciate, I think, in each of these issues mm-hmm. for various reasons. I know you're going to appreciate Starfire's issue the most. Like, we can just say it now. <laughs> <laughs> but before we get there, which ironically is the last issue, we will start with Cyborg's story. <laughs> Everyone's at the Grand Canyon, and this is kind of like everyone sits at the campfire, and each person takes a turn reading or talking about their lives. And that's each issue. Cyborg starts his story out from him as a child and what that means growing up with two parents who are scientists devoted to nothing but knowledge and how it kind of robbed him of a childhood in a way. And somebody to take advantage of that was Ron Evers, his first friend, as he puts it, which is really cool that like, before I even get into like a lot of what these issues have specifically, Each one, I think, introduces key characters that are like mainstays throughout Titan Mm -hmm. 4. And for Cyborg especially, Ron Evers is a continuously reappearing character. This issue was very strange and it's like, in its language of like what race is in the 80s. I don't know. It was very strange because on one end I got it, but then on one end I didn't. And I don't have the power to speak on that. What did you, how did you feel about like, what cyborg story how it was framed i mean it's a little uncomfortable in today's day um i really wish i could remember the name of the twitter poster but she had been commenting on the idea of supposedly the dc movies want to do a black superman and she was expounding on this concept of well, when it's still white people in control of these black heroes, then they aren't really ours, meaning for the black community. These are a representation of what a white person thought a black person would be. And so Mm -hmm. Cyborg and Black Panther and Storm and all, they aren't black characters in that they were created by black people for black people. We get for example, in this story, very much kind of Marv Wolfman's 80s level awareness of racial politic. And I think, I mean, I'm not, I'm certainly not saying Marv Wolfman is a bad person. And I think he was, again, trying to be sort of progressive in this story and in the way he depicts Victor, but it certainly falls into some negative stereotypes where I think Victor very much becomes this sort of concept of one of the good ones versus Ron, who is this very sort of, at least in this issue, a very thin character who kind of just hates the white man to hate him. We get a couple of moments where like Marcy explains that her dad was passed over for a promotion just because of his race. And so Mm -hmm. we do get some of that sense of oppression, but then Ron is just sort of this straw man character. Who's like, I've had it. I'll destroy everything because I've never had a fair chance. And I mean, that is a motivation, I guess, but it's not how we would write things today. Right. (laughs) Yeah. It's, it was very strange. I took it more as like, class prejudice if Mm -hmm. I if I read it as anything 
because uh, both Cyborg and his parents by default are viewing stuff from a very like classist perspective, right? Like mm. they look down on Ron, in my opinion, because he's poor, like because he doesn't grow up with the advantages that that the Cyborg, like that the Stone family grew up with. And like the Stone family's like, well, you know, you just need to be better. And I think in Ron's perspective, he doesn't know how. So his motivation was all out of like anger at not knowing how to be better and anger mm-hmm. that like for him, his, 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 uh, he blamed like white people for basically not knowing how to be better, like not teaching sure. him how to be better or like growing up in a society where he wasn't allowed to know how to be better. Mm-hmm. I'll never know what it was like in the eighties to be black. And I, I don't, um, I don't want to speak on it, you know, like, so it was very strange to see Marv like take such a staunch position uh, I'd really like to know if he consulted anyone on the matter, if like before writing this, mm. he maybe like interviewed people or, you know, had help in any way kind of forming Cyborg's story other than this is Cyborg's story and this is what it is. And maybe I hope that along the line, like as we continue reading, a lot of the origin story that he has gets fleshed out more. I mean, it basically was spelled out for us here, like from childhood to adulthood we kind of know what cyborg's life was like now but i really want to see and hope to see that like later down the line there are other people who take a stab at his origin story or kind of flesh things out more to kind of give a little bit more purpose and a little bit more nuance because reading this from today's perspective it doesn't it doesn't seem fully fleshed out in my opinion Mm. however marcy and ron both continuously show up within Titans lore. So it will be exciting to see them come back. We do get Ron's supposed death, which Titan trope again is the side character dying. I say dying in very loose quotes. This story came out how many years ago? Everyone knows Ron Evers came back. <laughs> <laughs> and we get the first mention of a Mr. K who I didn't know. I didn't look up who it was just to like save my own. I don't want to like spoil myself of like if he comes back, who that could be. But he's also mentioned in this one. Issue two gives us Ron's uh, story time, I guess I'll put it. We get more about her mother, Arella, and what it was like to grow up on Azeroth and what it means mm-hmm. to be a member of this out-of-world society. I think it speaks a bit to why I don't really jive with Raven overall, because there's a very big focus on the emotionless perspective and I find that makes it very difficult to relate to Raven Um, it makes it difficult to relate to the people of Azeroth as well because I spent a lot of story being like she's a child what the hell are you doing right (laughs) when Juris is like oh we need to kill her and I'm just like uh no she's a baby what's wrong with you yeah but I guess that's in line too with like every child of Trigon was either killed or had their mother killed or Mm -hmm. you know like these these spawns I guess in a weird way to put it like they just weren't they weren't supposed to exist but you know she does and she's a baby so let her live yeah rude (laughs) and then she has to live without emotions is the counterpart to that which I actually thought was very made me think of George Lucas Jedi and this idea of oh you can't be emotional or you'll be evil and it's like, I think the opposite is probably more likely true, but... It's so strange. Um, we get a little bit more... That's the thing that I took away from this issue the most is the explanation of her powers and how they work and the explanation of, like, she has a part of Trigon in her at all times. If she lets her emotion uh, waver, uh, that part of her will come out and it's always going to be evil. And I... To your point, I've never really liked that aspect of her power set. It's like, mm, I don't, I guess I get it, but like also, no. Like, I think <laughs> the I think the cartoon really did a good job of explaining a way why this power is strange. And like, she can have emotions. She just doesn't need to always be, she doesn't, she just can't let him get out of control. And, and this issue very staunchly says like, she can't have no emotion ever just none nada and it's like uh can't she have some like at least in the cartoon she was like a fun sarcastic character a a nice folly to beast boys antics like 
that's what I need her to be. That mm-hmm. like, that's what I need her character to encompass. Cause if she's just going to be there to like, basically be team teleportation and healing, like I'm not going to connect with her anymore. Mm-hmm. I I've connected with her so much over the, over the past two volumes that like, if she retreats to just being somebody who is just devoid of any emotion at all times, I'm not, I'm not going to like where they go with her character. Mm-hmm. Fingers crossed. I know a lot of like what happens to Raven, um, not necessarily from reading the source material, but from what I've read online and it'll, it's very interesting to see hopefully where they decide to go with her character in terms of writing. Mm. Cause I hope it doesn't go in that direction, <laughs> you know? Yeah. As it pertains to the story though. So we get more about what Trigon was like as a, as a demon for Arella, we are revisiting Arella's origin story and why she had Raven in the first place. Mm-hmm. But what I really liked out of this was the explanation of Azeroth in terms of who Azar is. Apparently on Azeroth, uh, for those of you watching, uh, Azar is a mother goddess chosen kind of like once every generation, there's always going to be one Azar to take up the mantle and basically be like not queen of Azeroth, but like the goddess of Azeroth, that goddess, the goddess is a a person, a part of the society. Mm. And I really liked that. I mean, I thought it was neat. They describe it as being a mother daughter mantle. So the Azar we are introduced to is the last of them having had no children herself. Um, I was very intrigued by the origin and the explanation that Trigon is the manifestation of the banished evil impulses of all of the people of Azeroth, because that also would suggest that had they not done their, we're going to make a peaceful ideal society, we would have never had this all powerful demon threatening anybody as well. And so it creates that no good solution to a degree (laughs) it's like that weird like chicken and the egg scenario like if one didn't exist then did the other one not exist and i did appreciate that we finally got an origin story to what trigon is Mm -hmm. when i was reading books trigon was always just mentioned as a demon right like he was Mm -hmm. always just a member of like underworld mythology this great all-powerful being so on and so forth so it was really interesting when they did go into like what his actual origin story was at this time that he actually spawned as a response to like the massive passivity that is Azeroth that like out of that came the opposite, like the pure embodiment of chaos, because I actually never really knew where Trigon came from before that, other than that he was Mm -hmm. demon (laughs) with a capital D. (laughs) So amidst all of this, uh, Arella is staying on Azeroth with Raven as a child and we get this character Juris like we said before who uh, basically just attempts to murder Raven is killed by Trigon at this at the gate to like Trigon's dimension at that moment that's when Azar explains that she's going to train Raven solely and willfully and that Arella Raven's mother will have basically no part in raising her daughter Mm. which was strange yeah (laughs) It explains why when we saw Raven go to Azrath in the first volume, she went to Arella specifically, because in my mind, before I knew that Azar had passed away in here, that's who I thought she would have gone to. Azar's dying wish was for, was for Arella to raise Raven. And I thought at that moment, Are- Azar was going to be like, raise Raven as a mother. Like, this is the time to like imbue the other side of what Raven could be and like, you can show Raven that like she can show emotion, but no, Azar is very much like, okay, it's your turn to basically be what I was. Yeah. It was very and weird. Because <laughs> she like gets the headpiece and stuff from Azar as well, that it would be I like it shouldn't she be Azar to a degree now? But at the same time, the writing has been like, oh, I just do random things around the temple. I'm just a servant. I'm like, but are you? Because you fight. And hold off Trigon in the end of the last time we saw him. I don't feel like this was necessarily developed as much as it could have been. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I assume that there are their teachings on Azeroth about like how their powers work. Because I think everyone who goes there is imbued with some form of mystical energy. But they don't really explain that. And like you said, like they kind of made Arella 
the janitor of Azeroth. I'm like, why? She was perfectly fine being the person she was volume one. I didn't need to know that. We also get Raven's rings explained because sometimes when they draw her, they draw her with these gaudy rings and that those were Azars. Mm-hmm. And that kind of ends that issue. Really interesting stuff from that one. None of the characters there really show up again. I think Azar was my favorite moment of it to really explain like this, I guess previously to my knowledge was like a male dominated society was actually run by a mother goddess named Azar. And whenever like you hear her talk about Azar, it's always, I never knew it was always about a person, you know, Mm -hmm. like an actual full fledged being, not just some ethereal goddess in the mystical sense. So that was really cool to me. That was like my favorite part. (laughs) And then we get into issue three Right before your favorite one, we get one all about Beast Boy. How do you reflect on uh, on his... I mean, you mentioned it, and just that I find the framing device excruciating and kind of nonsensical. Oh, like, painful. There, there are five panels of him burning hot dogs because he's too involved in his story to pay attention to the hot dogs. And like, why do the hot dogs matter so much, Marv? What is going on? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, by the third panel, I skipped him. I, I, I'm just going to admit it now. I skipped. I didn't care. Okay. He's a bad cook. Apparently it, you're not cooking hot dogs. You're literally putting them on fire. Like they were giving him shit for burning hot dogs. And he's like, I'm a good cook. Just you watch. It's like, it, it, you, there's no cooking involved. You're just putting hot dogs on fire. I had to skip the last two. I had to. At any time we cut, I'm like, I'm leaving. I'm yeah. just moving on to the next panel. It's very 80s gar. He's very not especially bright or evolved in his treatment of women. Um, I think one thing that I did find sort of interesting about the story, though, is the difference between how Gar narrates it and how George actually shows it going down, which I'm sure Marv wrote in part two. And so, like, we get all this Gar, oh, I'm so smart, I'm so sexy, I was so successful and women were falling over me. But then on the page, we're like, there were no women there. You weren't successful. Like... So that... before he was on the Doom Patrol, he was living in some like shabby apart, like not even shabby, in like some deranged like apartment. Mm-hmm. Also, how young was he? Because they established he's the youngest member of the team. Yep. If he's like 17, 18, he was living in some deranged apartment at like 15, 14. What? Yeah, it doesn't like, make too much sense in that regard. He has Where a very was convoluted figure? backstory with two different adoptive millionaire parents, which just odd. <laughs> <laughs> so it's we we get the origin story of his powers, which I really appreciate because it we it's like right here. If you want to know his origin story, this is the one to go to. Is Beast Boy's story in Tales of the Teen Titans? He ends up with this disease called Sakushia in the uh, upper, uh, I don't know how to pronounce that. Do you know how to pronounce that? Because um, I don't want to I it. gave up on the made up words. Y- yeah, it's yeah. like la, lumum, Lumumba. Oh, that just sounded awful saying. <laughs> but that's where he got this disease. His parents being the great scientists that they were, cured him, but at the cost of giving him these abilities to shape shift into different animals and having green skin. At that point, his parents die in a waterfall accident, and he is raised by King Tawaba for a moment. Um, I'm assuming that, like, these points in his life literally don't last longer than, like, a year at Mm -hmm. most. Like, he didn't live in that African tribe more than, like, seven months max. Because somebody, Mobu, was planning to kill him for a long time. I took the liberties of looking up who Mobu is because, like, oh, is this person going to show up later on? Doesn't. I was like, oh, that's kind of sad. I was kind of hoping like this part of his story where he lived on this African tribe was going to be revisited a little bit more because I actually thought it could have given him a little bit more nuance and a little bit more dimension. No, it doesn't. (laughs) We get the Uh, bad father figure then, the Galtry guy who then occurs through the story. I I presume Uh, he's the one that will recur throughout more of the story going forward as well. Yeah, uh, he... He takes Beast Boy in and his sole reason is basically just he wants the inheritance that Beast Boy could have from his parents. Rude as fuck, by the way. Gross. 
the theme of like awful parent figure parent figures continues and poor beast boy <laughs> but amidst all of this beast boy's demeanor is like the happiest it could ever be apparently i don't know how because if i was like in his position like holy jesus christ the amount of therapy i would need mm-hmm. uh, it would be insurmountable because it's just crazy before he even joins doom patrol before he even joins any of that he uh ends up getting his tv career started at like what i'm assuming is like 13 on the show space trek 2022 which was the year is hilarious to hear out loud and read out loud because it's literally next year. We get a great panel about the golden age of the Teen Titans featuring great characters, like top tier, like some of my favorite characters in the Teen Titans lore. And this is our next Titan trope, which is the, I, I kind of titled it the Teens of Teens because he mentions Titans, Teen Titans West. He mentions the Teen Titans, but those are not the only teen teams uh that exist within the teen titans canon there are many and they are large (laughs) and uh, it's cool that like he mentions the first few uh i know that like you know this era of the teen titans specifically but how was it like getting at least a little peek into what the golden age would have been like i mean it kind of goes over my head for the most part i have no idea who narc is for example you don't Uh, know narc no, nope. you don't remember never heard him. Of him. He was in um, he was in the cartoon with Cole. Hmm. Uh, remember when Cole would turn into like the blue diamond form? Narc was the guy holding her. Okay. Yeah, that's who Narc is. I mean, for who you could know is Narc, that's who Narc is. <laughs> but like Narc, Lilith, Bumblebee, Hawk and Dove, these characters all started. Even Starfire himself, Red Star, like they all started in the Golden Age. And it's cool to see, like, this is, like, the window into, like, what that era was like. Uh, I think it would be fun, as a side note, to do, like, a Golden Age retrospective, like, one episode about, like, what the Golden Age was. And we could read, like, something, uh, some compendium or whatever about, like, what that era was like for the Teen Titans and just reflect upon it. But this is a cool first window into, like, what that was like. Back to Garfield. Uh, we get another instance about his life with the Doom Patrol. Uh, we talk about the Doom Patrol's death again, and that sparked him to kind of jump back into heroism. But then we get Jillian, who is his girlfriend at the time, mm-hmm. uh, a blonde who we all know is like Beast Boy's like de facto type, but here is where it started. And she's captured by this villain with the code name The Arsenal which for other comic book readers who are more modern, they know that as Red Arrow, Speedy's moniker at one point in time. But it's cool to see that this was actually the first Arsenal, this basically Iron Man rip who (laughs) steals Jillian, fails at like stopping Beast Boy in any form. And then it's revealed that it actually was Gultry, that abusive father figure he had for a minute, who is staunchly defeated, thankfully. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I never thought I'd be rooting for Beast Boy harder. I'm like, yes, end him. He's such a douche. <laughs> like, God. It doesn't make a ton of sense other than comics, I think, to be like, oh, yeah, I'm your lost stepfather in an Iron Man suit abducting your girlfriend to try and get your money again. That makes no sense. But... <laughs> um, I mean, I think it does kind of help explain Beast Boy a little bit more. Um, You certainly see that he operates as a front to all of this trauma and suffering that exists underneath that. You had mentioned before that like Marv and George do talk about like the massive amount of melodrama they wanted to inflict (laughs) in these books and they get it here because it's like, like you just said, that that was ripped from like some soap opera somewhere <laughs> it, it had to have been in some way shape or form but that ends that one and then comes issue four our last issue and i'm assuming your favorite because it is all about starfire and her origins on tamaran mm-hmm. and i'll let you take the lead because i assume uh this is your your <laughs> your mainstay go ahead i love starfire of course i think this is where we finally get introduced to the concept of dark fire um and it 
is another one of those stories that I think worked better in the 80s and now in modern sensibilities, it's kind of more of a head tilter because it's explained to us that, I mean, to a degree, dark fire was kind of inherently evil, but the main explanation is- Black fire. Black, oops, dark is brother. Uh, black fire. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, black fire didn't have a chance. Um, it's very quickly explained that she had this childhood illness that rendered her incapable of flying and it's not really dwelt on, but Tamarain society revolves around flying and she's basically relegated to this state of non-personhood for having a disease as a child. And it's really a super tragic backstory, but the way it's told is just, oh yeah, Blackfire was evil and hated everything from the beginning. It's like, well, maybe because of the way she was treated. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, they, they explained early on that she was passed over as the next queen because she couldn't fly. And it's like, oh, that's sad. <laughs> like, okay. Yeah. But with zero compassion for Blackfire, it's the story of how she betrayed all of her people to the Citadel. And as a requirement of that, Coriander had to be enslaved. Um, and another thing that stood out to me in this issue is kind of just how blatant they were about that slavery. Like they don't say the words, but the implications are very clear that there was a great deal of sexual abuse involved. Um, they try to pass that off, I think in the script as degradation, but I think we, understand what the positions and the outfits and the illusions are all suggesting. And so in that regard, at least, it is still a cool Starfire story because it is still about her emancipation in a way, ultimately. And we are again also very introduced to this idea of Tamaran as a place of love and their loving, except for Blackfire. Unless you're Blackfire. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're Blackfire, because she came out evil with the way they drew her. I could not. <laughs> the eyebrows. <laughs> the eyebrows. It was the eyebrows for me because when she came out, she just whoop, that like evil, like 80s whoop. I could not. I'm like, oh, well, she's just automatically going to be evil. I mean, maybe her mom knew that the minute she saw the way her like head shape was formed and how her eyebrows were going to grow. <laughs> she's just like, yeah, she's going to be the evil one. We're not going to acknowledge her presence. It, it was, was insane. A situation. They're like, this child is evil. Let's, <laughs> this, let's one's try evil. This, one, this one's the evil category. We can just do a, a mulligan of sorts. Like, I could not believe the way they drew her. They just drew her with the intent of making her evil. It is tragic in a sense of like, I do like that Starfire was the only one to ever show compassion for Blackfire. Like her entire existence pre-slavery was trying to like include Blackfire and trying to like make Commander like her sister. Like Starfire mm -hmm. was this like symbol of compassion. And like, I feel like in, in a different universe, like Starfire, I don't think even wanted to be queen or wanted like, yeah, she was the princess, but like, I don't even think she wanted that mantle. Like, mm -hmm. I feel like she would have just given it to Blackfire if Blackfire had not, been so inherently evil by the way she was written so they have uh <laughs> and also like she pulls a single white female on starfire and kills her pet oh my god <laughs> i was like i wrote down snar when i was taking notes and i'm like oh is this like where you know uh in the cartoon she had the little pet i can't remember his silky. name right now my mind silky she had silky and i'm like oh is this like where they got silky from and then, like, the next panel, it shows Blackfire with Snar dead on the ground and being like, oh, someone killed him. And I'm like, ah, I guess not. <laughs> Just kidding, because he's dead. <laughs> it's like Coriander growing up. There's the war with the Citadel that they have going on. Um, the Tamarians being all about passion, they're, like, going to fight the sword to the fullest extent. But as Starfire is growing up, her and her sister have to go... Uh, they have to go fight in this like tournament thing which i thought was like a weird illusion of, like mortal combat and like just like okay you have to go here you have to fight these battles and do this training you aren't necessarily supposed to die but you could and mm -hmm. then you'll come back a warrior and then you'll go to war it's on um okara the war world planet mm -hmm. which we do see later on which is really interesting that this is like the inception of that planet commander can't just do anything right right she fucks up she 
she totally cheats, tries to kill her sister, admits it, and then gets banished, which kind of thrusts the entire like putting Raven and or putting Starfire in slavery storyline, which is insane. I, that whole thing, like, why, Commander? Like, you could just you could just be a great war general, and it'd be fine. Like, Mama, you like war. Like, just you could enjoy war for the Terranians, and we would be K. But mm. no, you went and cheated. So she's banished. She uh, betrays Tamaran. Uh, I did like that they kind of explained the goddess again, uh, Exal, and what that means to Tamaranians. Mm-hmm. It was a nice... We get these really cool parallels between her and, and Raven on kind of like opposite ends of the spectrum on like their worlds growing up having these strange similarities. And um, did you want to explain like the goddess Exal and what that meant to Starfire? Um... I don't remember her being explained especially well, other than Okara is supposed to be sort of her sacred space, and she was explained as being a living goddess, kind of numinous, conterminous with Okara, but not really personified. Like, we're never introduced, oh, by the way, here's the hall, hi. But yeah. It's- <laughs> <laughs> it was interesting. I like that, like, both her and Raven like mention like where they the goddesses they pray to and that they have Mm -hmm. goddesses that are like the mainstays of their hierarchy of their religion of their society you said a kind of mirror of Raven because Starfire talks about how Blackfire ended up teaching her the error of compassion and it's whereas Starfire has learned the extent and pitfalls of her emotions. Raven has had to have that instruction of none, no emotion for you. (laughs) None, nada. (laughs) You can't have it. No, no. (laughs) So they get captured, her and Blackfire, and it's revealed in that moment that like, you know, that's what kind of gives them the like manipulation of solar energy. That was never really a thing for them, which I didn't know. I thought that was always intrinsic to being a Tamaranian was having these powers and kind of explains why Ryan Ander, her brother, doesn't really play a bigger role in the comic books as I thought he did because he never experienced that. He didn't go through that change. It was only Blackfire and her sister, Mm -hmm. which like in my head canon would have probably made them stronger sisters. Like they have this thing that no one else has like, Okay, yeah. you can't fly, but like we have these crazy powers that like no one else has. No, nope. Blackfire's like, nah, I'm gonna use these and I'm gonna fuck you over again and again and again. So, oof, it's revealed at the end of this issue that like the entire Starfire's entire escape in issue one of volume one is all the direct response from Blackfire. Like all of everything that she went through was because of her sister. Mm-hmm. So, when Blackfire returns, which she does, we all know she's going to, it'll be interesting to see like what Starfire reacts, how she reacts. Like I'm very much looking forward to like that reunion and that clash because it's gonna, it's coming. Like we know it is. And it picks up right where Teen Titans kicks off. And I loved that sequence of her escape. Um, it gets a little darker because Marv and George do illuminate that she was directly seducing her guard, again, making it pretty explicit what slavery was like. Um, but again, I think we can maybe focus on the positive that slavery is over now and that she sets herself free um, just with that complicating factor, like you said, of it's all her sister's fault. <laughs> it's literally all her fault. Like there's there's no uh illusion there's no gray area like blackfire did all of that (laughs) and that kind of brings us to the end i mean they announce that they're a family they like do this like high five thing and then it's the end of the issue and i'm like left wondering like okay can we get back to the normal story please (laughs) brother (laughs) blood next (laughs) this was cute i liked it can i please get the next story (laughs) because this Mm. is weird (laughs) And that brings us to like the smallest Sheikah week ever because <laughs> there aren't many other characters to go through. As much lore dump as we got, this is all stuff from characters that we already know. I literally have five names on this list. Right. So it'll be very easy to go through. The first one is Dr. Polaris, mm. um, but he is a mainstay Green Lantern villain. So I feel like he deserves his own spot. Uh, he's giving me like strong Galactus vibes before. I think Galactus might've already been a thing at this point, but like 
the horn things. Mm -hmm. George loves drawing those things. We are going to see those again. That is a costume staple of his. However, the costume itself doesn't really work for me. Uh, what do you think? Um, there was a character called Tornado something at one point that I feel like it's very reminiscent of overall and just kind of blocky. Like it's just very blocky. Uh, with the exception of the head wings, there isn't much to make it stand out. There's the random horseshoe magnet as his emblem, which just feels very obligatory on top of the sort of generic cosmic warlord look. So it's a it's, it's a, a week. week. <laughs> it's a week. We get disruptive outfit, which I really liked your observation as being kind of like the reverse flash before reverse flash was a thing of being the predominant red and yellow. I know the evolution of the character's costume as it pertains to other people who carried the mantle. Mm -hmm. And his or his original costume is a definite week. I get the symbolism <laughs> behind it, but it's literally just like a bodysuit with like yellow and red. I mean, <laughs> if somebody cosplayed that, it's literally just his anti suit with like mm -hmm. paneling. That's it. It's the easiest costume ever. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, I, I I feel like Brain's Bedlam would have been like, and you picked a crappy costume too, like just to really nail it home, like why he doesn't want to have a son. Mm. So it's a week for me. Yeah, agreed. We get Red Star in his outfit. Something cool is that his costume hasn't really changed over the years. It's had some like minor instances of various costume changes. He gets a really nice costume in one year later, but it still has hints of this original look. So I think mm. based off of all that, I have to give it a chic. Like it's it's reminiscent of Russia, maybe Russian stereotypes, but so Russia in general. So I really appreciate it. It's fine. I would say there's definitely a, a sort of evolution of military fatigue into this originally. And of course, the Red Star for Russia, and that becomes his name. So yeah, no complaints, I guess. Starfire <laughs> was a bad choice, but... Yeah, name, name, name aside, <laughs> the outfit I think is a mistake. We get Arsenal's costume, which is basically just iron man but in like a maroon it reminded me of like the celestials from marvel yeah i'm like what is this galactic being down here on earth doing but it's not it's a guy in a robot suit on that derivativeness alone and maybe the bias of like i think he's like one of the shittiest characters in teen titans myth so far that we've read i'm gonna give him a week by far <laughs> yeah agreed it's... and then becomes uh i think your favorite of Sheikr week and that's good old blackfire in this iconic look i love the spikes i love the silver i like the juxtaposition like black blue bodysuit with the silver armor the only thing i don't like is those damn eyebrows that is the only thing and everything else can stay i love yeah. the headpiece like it's I just oh even when people try to modernize it i feel like we're still calling back to this suit overall so yeah i guess my I only criticism the, would be i don't see a lot of tamaran in it like tamaranians are all very big into showing skin and so i guess it's sort of her rejection of the society that she's yeah. head to toe armor but, agreed i the only thing i like that they've modernized with her is certain instances um, I think the Injustice game was the first one to really do this was uh, she had like inverted hair. So her hair was like the same, like long length, but like it was black ombre into like this pale yellow. Mm. And I liked that like antithesis of her and Starfire. It's one of the things I think they took away from the cartoon the most because in the cartoon, yes, she's Tamaranian. She has the same skin tone and everything, but she has like this stark black hair to Raven or to Starfire's like bright orange. Mm -hmm. um so that's the only thing i would maybe change but other than that it's a fantastic chic like she's the top look of this entire volume by far then that ends this volume thankfully we can get back to the main story because i need to know more about brother blood and this will be his first introduction i don't know how much you know about him but it'll be really interesting to see your response to who he is as a character and uh, for our reference he's one of brian's favorite villains so cool. it'll be interesting to see what becomes of him if you want to find us you can find us on uh, titans together pod on instagram uh, we both run the account 
subscribe to us on YouTube, like this video. I'm um, doing like the YouTube influencer thing. <laughs> like, subscribe, share. Check we out. do have a T public now. So if you want a t-shirt with the logo on it, you can get that. I have mine coming in the mail soon. So hopefully by next uh, episode, we'll both be adorned in our, uh, out, our t-shirts. Where can they find you outside of our Titans Together stuff? Um, I'm GeekyJP on Instagram, and I am also Proletary Thought on Twitter. I'm still never going to be able to pronounce that, by the way. Uh, if you want to find me, you can find me on Instagram and Twitter, both under Joe Pride Art and Cosplay. Uh, yeah, that'll be it. Bye. Bye. I, I turned the page and it's just, it's just Blackfire snarling this like evil picture. <laughs> I'm so dead. <laughs>